Two Rivers Talks is brought to you by Two Rivers Biz Starts. Also by Two Rivers Main Street. And by Raleigh Point Economic Advising. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi. Welcome to Two Rivers Talks with Darla and Todd, your connection to all things Two Rivers. If you're from Two Rivers, used to be from Two Rivers, or want to be from Two Rivers, you'll find news, fun, music, art, and more. Um, today's guest co-host is City Council Member Bill LeClaire. Um, Todd should be returning to Wisconsin next week, so we'll have to put up with him on our next broadcast. But for today, we've got um, Bill LeClaire, who is uh, graciously consented to, <laughs> to helping me out, and I really appreciate it. Um, Bill and I will be talking about current events and community news. And also in this episode, I talk with Representative Shea Sortwell about the status of the COVID-19 Safer at Home extension lawsuit and when the state might start opening back up. So thank you to Shea for being with us again. Um, also today, you can learn more about the Two Rivers High School Graduates Banner Project with a special guest, uh, Mr. Jay Remaker, who is also on city council. And thank you to Jay for starting this initiative. And we'll be hearing from our friend, Mr. Roger Rusov during our Main Street Minute segment. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring Bill into the broadcast. Hi, Bill. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Um, uh, just cold right right out of the gate. Um, I'd like you to take it away with word of the day. Word of the day is Peregrunate. <laughs> Peregrunate? <laughs> Peregrunate, I think, right? Peregrunate, okay. yes. <laughs> Peregrunate. And that means to travel. Or journey, especially to walk on foot. Yeah, I thought that was a good stumper for you. <laughs> you could tell I like you, right? Okay. Definitely, definitely um, not spell. <laughs> um, and now we'll we we'll get started with in the news, and I'll go ahead and start this off. Um, Manitowoc nursing homes encourage you to call ahead before doing a window visit. Administrators at both Felician Village and Shady Lane in Manitowoc said they want interaction for the residents just in a healthy and safe way. Neither site has seen infections from coronavirus and both are practicing social distancing within their facilities. Both also say window visits are permitted and encouraged, but with caution. Um, they want to be aware of the visits beforehand that way someone can be in the room with the resident so they're not frightened by the knock. Some of their residents with dementia may become frightened if they hear a knock or do not recognize the person at the window. Planned visits also allow staff to inform residents in nearby rooms of visits so they don't become frightened if they see someone approaching the building or a window. Um, for our assisted living places here in the city of Two Rivers, call ahead and see exactly what their policies are. But I know that they they understand the importance of loved ones being able to spend time with their residents. Congrats is from Wisconsin. You're the strongest state in the country. And the study shows that this is according to a study based on data from the International Powerlifting Federation. The study looked at home state of every ranked powerlifter and a group of more than 15,000 people and determined which states produce the most strong men and women per capita. Wisconsin led the charge with 236 nationally ranked powerlifters for 1 million residents. Wyoming was next with 193 per million, followed by Louisiana, Alaska, and Massachusetts to round out the top five. That's right. I was kind of surprised when I saw that, but I thought that was pretty cool. Um, construction is underway at the solar en energy facility in Manitowoc County. When completed by the end of the year, uh, the 800 acre site with 500,000 solar panels will generate 150 megawatts of energy, 
which is the equivalent of powering more than 33,000 homes. WPS says it also will be acquiring 100 megawatts at another site in southwestern Wisconsin that is currently under construction. Once the two sites are complete, WPS will have a total of 200 megawatts of solar energy they will be able to provide to their customers. Uh, the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office announces Deputy and Corrections Officer of the Year. Deputy Christopher Haymeyer, a 10-year veteran, was named to the county's Law Enforcement Officer of the Year for having demonstrated outstanding service to the community and his fellow officer. And Officer Timothy Kleckner, Klinker was named the county's Corrections Officer of the Year due to his quick thinking, and reaction on several occasions. Congratulations to both of these fine officers. Uh, this is some sad news that I'm sure everyone's pretty much, I'm, I'm sure they've heard it by now. But Holy Family College, the old Silver Lake College, just recently changed, went through a name change, um, is to discontinue all operations at the end of the summer term of this year and discontinue all operations by August the 29th. The Franciscan Sisters of Charity, of Christian Charity in Manitowoc, made the difficult decision to approve termination of the college's operations after careful consideration of current enrollment and fundraising challenges, as well as a detailed analysis of the college's fiscal position. And the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic only made a tough situation untenable. The current class of 2020 will be the final graduating class at Holy Family College, which will work uh, with all other students to assist them in transferring to other schools so they may pursue and complete their college education. And here's a bright spot. To that end, Bellin College says current and newly admitted nursing students at Holy Family can transfer their credits and current financial aid to Bellin. In a statement, that college promises students will receive an equal or comparable educational experience regarding cost, time frame, and licensure. Well, we got some good news about education. Lakeshore Technical College turned almost 700 courses into online learning in two weeks amid the COVID-19 crisis. Despite everything going on in the world, the faculty and staff at Lakeshore Technical College have been laser focused on supporting their students in our community. In advance to the safe at home order, all faculty and staff convened for two days of intense training to shift courses to an online format. Within two weeks, 691 courses transitioned from face to face to online learning. This was a monumental task for LTC's faculty and staff, but they rose to the challenge and exceeded all expectations to support each other and our students. Thank you for all your hard work. That isn't that, good. that's amazing, isn't it? In just two weeks that they were able to put all of that online. So we're losing one college, but we have LTC, which is a premier um you know, technical college in our area, and we're very fortunate to have them. And uh, that was a lot of hard work, but it just kind of proves and shows their dedication to their students and to the and to the region. Um, I think there's something we can mention about Silver Lake. I think they said the the Music Conservancy was going to stay open. They oh, I think you're right. Yeah, lessons and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Um, Wisconsin, this one I'm, I'm on the fence about. Wisconsin is waiving the behind-the-wheel driver's test during the pandemic. To say these are unprecedented times in which we find ourselves living these days is kind of an understatement. Um, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic has upended just about all aspects of our lives over the past several months. Things are happening we never could have imagined, like seeing gas selling for under $2 a gallon, or having to not take that dreaded behind-the-wheel test with a DMV examiner to get your driver's license. Ooh, I don't know about this. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation 
has a really big backlog of would-be drivers waiting to take their test. So in order to speed things up, they said that starting Monday, May the 11th, you no longer have to take that test to get a driver's license in our state. Of course, there are a few criteria you have to meet first. 16 and 17-year-olds have to take an approved driver's education course, log 36 hours of practice driving, and get permission from a parent or guardian to waive the road test. So, Bill, what is your opinion of this? I thought, uh, well, you know, as long as the parents are involved with their kid, it, it's. I think it's it's fine. I think it would it would work out great. But you know how many parents aren't involved with the kids. But you know, right now, parents are home. A lot of them are, but a lot of them aren't too. But the fact is. I think uh, somehow they should maybe also make the parents give the kids a test. Just actually do the test. Their their parents, their uncle, their brother, older brother, sister, you know, somebody should test them within the family and 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 document. It. I think that would that would have been a, a better way to go. Or and maybe there are kids that can't do it, but uh, I think. Uh, Maybe uh, they could have actually took volunteers from the community that would have signed up to do it. You know, I don't know. There's probably a lot of liability in that. But Right. Uh, no, I like I your think... idea of having a, a parent or a somebody responsible put the put the the new driver through his or her paces, you know, because uh, that that's going to separate the the children from the adults is that is that driver's test and uh so kind of like a, a do-it-yourself type of thing a diy driver's testing so but i think that's a really good suggestion um so let's go on to city info if you want to go ahead and start us off on that the city hall remains closed to the public until further notice and hopefully that's soon that it opens Please make payments by mail, online, or by using the drop box on the 18th Street side of the building. Right. Other include the library, community house, senior center, and other city facilities remain closed to the public. Reminder, there will be a pie fundraiser at the senior center with outside curbside pickup on May 21st and 22nd. Visit the center's Facebook page for more information. Parks and trails are open per the governor's safer at home order. Playgrounds, where the playground equipment is, remain closed. Right. And, and to River City Council, the next meeting is on Monday, May the 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, we have rem remote live streaming on Facebook. The agenda will be posted online and the, the public can participate. So go to the city's website and find out more information on how to be involved in the city uh, council meeting on the first and third uh, Mondays of the month. We have a Tariver student to be part of an online musical. 15 year old Ethan Stokes of Tarivers has already had his share of stage time in plays and musicals, but now the high school freshman is preparing for a prestigious online role with while the COVID-19 pandemic remains in effect. Ethan's mom, Deanne Stokes, explains after showing the big 1-0 in Zoom musical, Zoom musical, Zoom musical <laughs> format, some word, format two weeks ago, the company known as iTheatrics. Uh, I theatr I theatric will be featuring their second Zoom is called Uni Uni the Unicorn. And Ethan had, was asked to be one of the 15 students nationwide to be part of this special musical. Ethan Stokes told us he plays the part of the unicorn teacher, referring to it as both very imaginative and a little different. Ethan, who has done online summer workshops in New York for several years, returned less than a year ago from a nine-month tour with a professional production of Finding Neverland. He said that opportunity to perform as an actor in a professional setting built up his confidence. 
Stokes looks forward to returning to the classroom and he plans to keep doing productions at school and with Treehouse Theater. Right. Wow, that, that's quite a accomplishment for one of our young students. Oh, absolutely. And if you've been watching um, our episodes, we've had uh, twice now the opportunity to show video from the Two Rivers High School show choir. And Ethan is in show choir. So if you've seen those those videos, you've seen Ethan. Um, but what what a what you know, he's really already had a career, you know, if he's already been in New York. And I mean, that's just amazing. Um, I give him a lot of credit and I give a lot of credit to his family too, because they're very involved. And uh, so good luck to him. And it will be if I can find the correct link, I'm going to add it into the show notes so that everybody can enjoy this production. Um, we want to uh, let everyone know that Two Rivers officer Tim Culligan has retired after 22 years of outstanding service. According to the Two Rivers Police Department's Facebook post, Officer Culligan started his career with the PD as a community service officer for many years before attending the police academy at Fox Valley Technical College. As an officer, he served as a dedicated field training officer, preparing new officers for the job. He also had the role of animal control officer. Prior to his service with the department, he served admirably in the U.S. Air Force. Thank you, Officer Culligan, for 22 years of service to the Two Rivers Police Department and community. We wish you well. Rivers New Cobblestone Hotels and Suites Closer to Completion. Construction on a new cobblestone hotel and suites in downtown Two Rivers, which is set to open in July, is coming along great. The city posted photos of the building on Facebook that show the exterior signage in place. The Facebook post also noted the interior paint and trim work is also underway. The 55-room hotel will be at 16th and Jefferson Streets at the site of the former Sittinger Hardware Store. Decor will include local touches, such as photos of the Sittinger building. The hotel will be first new hotel in Manitowoc Rivers area. In two decades, the last one built was the American Inn by Wyndham on Hecker Road near Interstate 43 in Manitowoc. The average age of a hotel in the area is 39 years old. Um, two Rivers City Manager speaks on plans for Hamilton property and former golf course. City Manager Greg Buckley told seehafernews.com the two sides have exchanged appraisals and arrived at a preliminary at preliminary terms to negotiate the purchase of the entire Hamilton property. He explains not all of the details have been worked out yet, and it hinges notably on environmental liability insurance coverage and making sure the city isn't left with any un undue liability. The proposal is to point is to the point where the city council has approved the borrowing of funds this year to purchase the land for an estimated 1.25 to 1.5 million. Buckley says community plans for development have a clear intent that the water's edge remains public with walkways and dockage for transient boating along the river. The city manager added there are another seven or so acres away from the water, overlooking views from Rogers Street Fishing Village and toward the lake, which would present phenomenal redevelopment opportunities. Buckley also gave an update on plans by architect John Durbrow to transform the former Emerald Hills golf course into an arboretum and bird sanctuary. Conservancy zoning for the Van Derbro Arboretum has been approved and evidence of walkways on the property can be observed from Riverview Drive and State Highway 42. The city manager termed it a very unique, very ambitious, beautiful vision for the former golf course. I'm excited about that. That's pretty close to where we live, so it's going to be pretty nice. Absolutely. Uh, introduction and swearing in of Rivers PD 
Assistant Police Chief Benjamin Minard in presentation of a life-saving award to Officer Bradley Dimmick occurred on Monday, May 4th. Congratulations to these fine officers. May 5th was Liberation Day in Two Rivers' sister city of Domyślica, Czech Republic. 75 years since an advance party of Patton's 3rd Army, headed by Lieutenant Colonel Matt Conop of Two Rivers, arrived in his ancestral hometown to announce its liberation from Nazi occupation. And to hear the story of the liberation, watch Two Rivers Talks episode number 24, during which we interviewed Matt Conop's grandson, Patrick DeWayne. It's a fascinating story, and it's a beautiful relationship that we have with this uh, stunning city over uh, in the Czech Republic. The city of Two Rivers is now the owner of 2023 Washington Street, former Unimart, uh, through the assignment of county rights in tax foreclosure. The goal is blight elimination and redevelopment. And I, I got to say, add another thing. This is in the new uh, tax incremental district that we uh, created for building the Culver's restaurant. So there's an opportunity there for somebody. Fantastic. Um, here's some sad news. Memorial Day 2020. Unfortunately, the parade and ceremony at the cemetery is canceled. City staff is looking at options for an online tribute with a salute to our military luminaria display planned for Central Park. Launch ramp and fish cleaning station at Vets Park are open. The Maritime Metro Transit Two Rivers Route 1 and Manitowoc Routes 2 and 3 are up and running again, as you probably have noticed. Uh, the buses run Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. Riverside Foods Expansion Project. Construction is well underway, shooting for project completion by 2020 year-end. The $8 million project is projected to create 30 new jobs. That's great. And 606 Parkway Boulevard, which is the former Paragon property, the city is in discussion with two parties who have shown interest in the property, Community Development Director Rungi and City Manager Buckley have also had recent discussions with state and federal agencies regarding possible grant funding to assist with rehabilitation of the building, as well as partial demolition. Culver's Restaurant, this $3 million project timeline has been extended pending the COVID-19 situation. Right. And remember to keep calm and carry out. For more information on your favorite local eateries, visit the Main Street website at www.tworiversmainstreet.com. And Bill, I want to thank you for being my co-host today. I really appreciate it. I Did you have honest. fun? Yes, it was fun. I was okay. honored to do it. <laughs> All right. Hi, Darla. Here to talk about the Trimmers High School 2020 grad project. Um, saw it on Facebook. Seen the city put up banners on their light poles on their downtown. Thought it was a great idea. Um, called Greg or sent the email to Greg Buckley, city manager. Asked him if we get banners put together, will we be able to hang them on the city streets? And uh, he came back said it was a great idea. Um, Two Rivers Water and Light Company would put them up for us and take them down. So that's awesome. Um, Got all excited, jumped in two feet forward, didn't think about nothing, just put it on Facebook looking for help. People would think this is a good idea or not, um, and it kind of blew up. People messaging me, calling me, just crazy. Um, got a hold of Miss Quistorf. Found out there's 110 students, which is pretty decent amount of students. Um, 
And then the uh, Van Ginkel family over at Trivers Clothing Company reached out and said, you know, they'd like to be on board with this, help us out, um, which I thought was great because they are local local business. They're here in the city of Trivers. They live in the city of Trivers. So they put an estimate together of $70 a banner. Um, I'd like to get them up June 2nd. So... They can display them for the month of June, take them down, and then uh, award them or give them to the students as we take them down. They could put them in their trophy cases or their parents can keep them for mementos. Um, that's the project. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Miss Quistorf and her staff over there at the school for helping getting the photos and the forms and all the little ins and outs that nobody knows taking care of that for us. That's awesome, especially at this time of the year. Um, the Van Ginkel family over at Trivers Clothing Company, they jumped in willing to help right away. Um, the crew of people that got a hold of me and wanted to help um, Corey, Chris, Randy and BJ, Mindy, Amy, Joanne, Shelly, Stacy. Um, we're on Zoom meetings. Um, everybody's got an idea, put it together. You know, they're very, very supportive. Um, and then Laura, she reached out to us. She's a graphic arts designer or graphic designer. Um, she did banners and uh, this type of stuff before. She designed the banner for us, which has turned out pretty cool. Um, so that's that's the project. Um, there's a couple of different ways to donate. Um, school is accepting checks. You can mail them to the school. Um, payable to the Trivers High School graduating class of 2020 or RevTrack. The school has a account set up for us that way. Um, Shoreline has Trivers here. They're accepting cash donations in the drive through for us, which is awesome. Um, Trivers Clothing Company, he's uh, accepting cash and check donations also again Trevor's high school graduating class of 2020 um, any more information you can want to join the project help out um, we have a Facebook page Trevor's high school 2020 grad project um, anybody's welcome to join but that's the deal hopefully uh, Hopefully this turns into a yearly thing would be kind of nice too. Thank you. Representative Shea Sortwell um, will be speaking with us about COVID-19 Safer at Home Extension, the status of the lawsuit, uh, some scuttlebutt that, you know, that he's probably hearing down in Madison and just where he anticipates um, we're going to be going from here, because May 26 isn't that far away. It'll be here very quickly. And who knows what's going to happen? Um, will May 26 become June 26, which then becomes July 26? Who knows? So we'll be finding out. So I am going to bring uh, Representative Sortwell into the stream. Hi, can you see me? I can. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, I suppose. Sure. So what is the, uh, you know, I I keep uh, going out there and reading all these different articles as to what's happening and the status and um, of, the, of the lawsuit right now, because actually, isn't, isn't May 11th kind of a magical day? That's actually when 
you know. <laughs> supposed to be a magical day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, we keep talking about the 26th because that's the yeah. the end of the extension. But the 11th, what kind of powers go away on the 11th? Um, well, a, a lot of the powers don't go away necessarily per se. So what happened is when he, when, uh, Governor was declared the the emergency the state of emergency. He he could do that for a whole lot of different things, not just for health things, but he could do it for a bunch of things. He actually did one not too long ago, in the middle of this health emergency. He did a, he released another one related to uh, fires, uh, forest fires, and things out in another part of Wisconsin. So uh, a state of emergency basically just sets certain things up in place and enables him to access certain funds and things. So it's not necessarily. Um, quite always what you expect but you know i remember scott walker doing some for like uh you know snow snowfalls and things and the propane shortage and it enables a governor to kind of make some additional decisions so basically what he did that that started that 60 day clock which runs out on may 11. um during that time he has a number of different powers um to be able to move things around shift things around be able to respond to whatever crisis he happens to declare in this instance, you know, healthcare crisis. Um, now, what happens at May 11 is that starts another clock because uh, we passed a bill a few weeks ago uh, related to the Corona, the Corona bill, the Corona package, the Corona issue. And basically that started clocks for what things he can continue to do for a certain amount of times after the emergency order expires. So he asked for a, uh, a carte blanche letter to continue to have uh, executive powers and emergency powers into perpetuity. And we said, um, no, <laughs> because I don't care what governor or president you have, nobody should have emergency powers forever. That's how you get Julius Caesars. And that's not, uh, that's not America. So what we went ahead and did is uh, we, in that bill, we passed a number of different things that enabled him to, for instance, uh, shift people around from other departments to be able to respond to the health crisis, um, uh, be able to um, fill certain positions and kind of just be able to move state resources around to better respond to it, um, including, you know, for, for Department of Workforce Development related to, as I'm sure you've heard a lot of complaints about people who are not getting their unemployment benefits they're supposed to be getting, um, as well as directly the health issues themselves. So, um Basically, we just start another clock. So depending on what part of the bill you're talking about, there's parts where they give him like 60 days beyond the this 60 days beyond the original 60 on May 11. Um, some that go 90 days. Um, the extended uh, unemployment benefits run out uh, go through I think the end of January of next year, maybe February. I, I'm not I'm drawing a blank, on, but early next year. So that's what happens in May 11th is. He can't continue to have all his powers except for the ones specifically specified in there. So what happens after that is right now he's saying that he can continue the shutdown orders through his DHS secretary um, really into perpetuity is what he claims using a different state statute. So we challenged that in court. Uh, they had the, the oral hearings this past uh, Tuesday, I think it was. Yeah. And if you guys haven't seen that, they're actually really interesting. They only take 90 minutes. They only scheduled 90 minutes for the oral arguments. So if you go to Wisconsin I, it's like C-SPAN here at the state level. So just look up Wisconsin I and you can find it and you can go in and find the, the Supreme Court uh, hearing. And it's it's really kind of interesting. And I actually think from hearing, watching that, because I watched the vast majority of it, I actually think that the legislature is probably going to win that court case in part because based off of the oral arguments, because um, – the lawyer for the administration did not do a very good job of trying to present their case. And I think the lawyer for the legislature did um, basically saying that there shouldn't be extended emergency powers without legislative oversight. That was kind of the argument we had is nobody should have indefinite powers under basically just because you can claim a health crisis, because quite honestly, we have health crises and health issues all the time. You can't just do that and do it forever. And so that's basically the argument. And I, and I think if you look at the way the justices asked their questions and the, and the responses they got from both lawyers, um, I, I think it came, became pretty clear that there's at least three justices that are ready to open up the state yesterday. <laughs> I think there are another, there's one justice who is going, would give Governor Evers, you know, 
permission to do anything he wanted. I got that distinct impression from her. And then there's three that kind of held their cart held their cards closer to their chest there. Um, one more liberal one and two more conservative ones that kind of mm, kind of hard to tell exactly what they were thinking, which honestly is kind of what justices are supposed to do. They're not supposed to tip their hand terribly well. Um, but all the, those three, so that was uh, the, the, the liberal Bradley, there's two Bradleys on the court. So uh, jo uh, Walsh Bradley, I guess is her, in her name. Uh, I can't remember her first name offhand, but Justice Walsh Bradley. And then uh, Chief Justice uh, Rebecca. Yeah. Is that well, Rebecca, Rebecca is the conservative. Rebecca Bradley is the conservative uh, justice on the court. And then there's, I can't remember her first name, but there's another uh, okay. Bradley who was a liberal on the court. And so Brad, liberal Bradley, uh, 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 Rogan, Chief Justice Rogan II and Justice Hagedorn, those three kind of held their cards closer to their chest as far as exactly what they were thinking. Um, but even still, I, I think from reading the tea leaves, as it were, I think they're going to rule in our favor. At that point, then, um, the, if he wants to go past May 11th for a shutdown, he's going to have to get approval from the legislature to do that. And, you know, we can, we can walk through what that means, but. Okay. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't that what the legislation legislators wanted was more inclusion, more involvement to begin right. with? Right. Well, especially, you know, the whole point of having the emergency, the emergency powers, emergency, dec emergency declarations is to enable a governor to respond quickly to an incident, because sometimes you don't have time to gather 99 state representatives and 33 senators into a room and try to get them all to understand what the heck is going on and, and make a decision. Okay. It's decisions sometimes have to be made very quickly. That's the point of the emergency orders. Um, but that's why it set that's why the emergency powers legislation gives a it gives a governor in Wisconsin anyways I'm not sure about how other states do their thing but gives the governor 60 days to be able to work on things and then if he thinks that this is a big enough issue and needs to go longer that emergency powers uh, statute says you need to get permission from the legislature to extend those powers so that that's what's supposed to happen is okay you know I, I can act quickly and start working on this and oh my goodness it looks like this is a bigger issue. Um, so I got to go talk to the representatives of the people and say, look, this is still a big issue. We're going to take another month or two months or six months to work on whatever we're working on. And I need your permission to do that. Can, you know, can we get together and, and come up with that plan? Because I'm sorry, 60 days is plenty of time <laughs> to get representatives and senators to understand what the heck is going on. It's unfortunate that we're as close to the deadline as we are. Um, but quite honestly, we actually didn't quite expect him to go this route because you know, like I said, the the uh, the emergency powers statute 323 makes it very clear he has to come to us for additional permissions. And so we were kind of expecting him to ask that. Now, he did ask for indefinite powers without us having to do anything. And we we're like, well, we're not going to do that. And we gave him some in the other bill that we passed. Um, but he he didn't ask for anything else beyond that. So we we're kind of waiting for him to do anything we kind of asked to talk to him and he didn't really seem interested in talking and then you know towards the end of his other executive order for shutdown um then they issued a new order under a different statute not have requiring oversight and so you know be, while, by him doing this trying to bypass bypass the legislature that's what we're taking him to court over and saying well you know are you trying to tell me that we have a big enough issue that we still need to be in a shutdown and yet the emergency declaration for a healthcare crisis has expired because that's what he's saying. If, if, if we go past May 11, his emergency declaration is gone. He no longer has, he no longer has a state of emergency related to healthcare crisis. And yet we're still, we would still be in a shutdown. That's a bizarre contradiction and doesn't make sense. And so what would happen is if they still wanna to continue to issue orders related to this, um, they would be considered emergency orders. This is assuming we win the case. And it, the justices can actually rule in a couple different ways. But assuming they rule the way in the direct way that we actually petitioned, um, we're we're asking them to, to call these emergency orders uh, emergency rulemaking. And so if they're emergency rulemaking, then they go back to the legislature for review. And we can kind of just ignore them, in which case then they're in effect. Or we can go to a hearing in the Joint Committee on, uh, was it... Uh, 
regulatory rules and regulation. I think it is JCRAR. Anyways, there's a joint committee of the Senate and the assembly that oversees emer- all rules, including emergency rules. And so then if it's something we, we don't agree with, we can vote it down. If we do agree with it, then we just kind of let it do its thing. Um, and so what we are hoping for, and we'll, it depends, governor could do what he wants with this, but um, we are hoping that he is going to take this and work with us and say, okay, well, this is what I want to do. Would you, would you be, would you be okay with this? And if so, then great. We just kind of do give it passive review and we continue to go along with, with a plan. If he doesn't do that, then that kind of puts us in the position of having to vote down from JCRAR his plan. And we'd have to pass a new bill legislatively, which I'm not a huge fan of passing it legislatively if we can help it because it's more difficult to change. You'd have to pass yet another law to fix it. Okay. Whereas, if, you know, he passes up an emergency rule and all of a sudden situations change, you know, they can pass another emergency rule that can be reviewed by the committee and be, and go through a lot more quickly to fix. So that's the better process for dealing with a situation like this. Um, but it, that depends on how cooperative he wants to be and how closely he wants to work with us or if he's going to continue to kind of do his own thing. Right. Well, I know I, I read an article and um, Governor Evers was saying he was doubtful that Safer at Home would even need to extend uh, past May 26th. Um, yeah, I think he's reading, I think he's reading the uh, the writing on the wall there, the handwriting on the wall there. Because I, I think he, wa- I think his people watched the the court the court case too. Because I think going into it, most of us kind of felt the, the justices could go either way on this. I mean, it, it was not a slam dunk for either side. Um, depending on how you wanted to read the statutes. So, but if you're, if you were watching that hearing, I can't imagine anybody watching that and not thinking that the administration is going to lose. Okay. So I think he's seeing that. So I think he's saying, you know what? I better start act. I better start acting like I want to do more with the legislature because I'm going to, I'm going to lose the case. I'm going to have to do it one way or another. Right. Cause I know one thing. um, Time. Did you notice that he, he put out additional restrictions before opening just the other day, they put out yeah, more standards that they said, we need to meet these before we can reopen. What, I, is, what was added or changed? Um, it, ha- it has something to do with basically um, things going on in hospitals. So there was like three standards and they were a little bit confusing, but okay. they were just additional standards on hospitals. And I, and I kind of looked at it. It's like, okay, as I thought about it, it's like, okay, at the, at the one point, on the one hand, he's kind of, showing by his his actions that he thinks he's going to lose this case and have to work more with us at the same time he's trying to put on more restrictions unilaterally and, and i kind of work why, kind of work through why would you do that and as i thought about it a little bit more i remember the, the last mash episode i don't know if you ever if you watch the show mash but it, it's interesting they, they know that the they know that the ceasefire is coming and they know that at some point they're going to have to work together you know we're not going to be at war anymore right and at the same time, so they're listening to the radio and, and up right up until, and this actually happened in real life. It wasn't just in the episode, but right up until the the hour and the, and the minute, literally the minute that the war was supposed to come to an end, both sides were pushing forward as hard as they possibly could. It was actually a very bloody time in the war because each one was trying to get another foot of ground before the ceasefire went into effect because the ceasefire said that as far as you go, when the ceasefire starts, you, that's your land. That's what you get to have. And I kind of thought about that. It's like, I, I think he's trying to stake out a little bit further, a little bit further out and say that, okay, well, this is where I'm going to be at. And uh, then, and then I can negotiate from there. That was, that was, I, that was the only reason I could think of why he would do it at the same time that he's kind of a, seeming to admit that he's going to lose this court case. Right. Well, I know one of the good things um, that I had read is that, He's thinking about maybe uh, starting to dial back on some restrictions even before May mm-hmm. 26. So we'll just have to wait and see, you know. Right. Right. Now, the the frustrating part about all this for a lot of people has been, oh, I'll give you an example. And and I love I love this exception, but, you know, Schrader's apartment store in Two Rivers is now open. I went down there and bought some jeans the other day because I needed some and okay. I'd rather go there than Walmart, especially, you know, given cer- current circumstances, they could use some help. But I saw other people complaining about that. And why did they complain about it? Because they've kind of found a loophole in order to open because ordinarily a department store shouldn't be able to be open right now under the executive orders, but they are a UPS drop-off location. And so that gives them an excuse to be open. And other people are kind of complaining about that saying, well, you know, you're, you're taking advantage of this loophole. Other people don't have a UPS drop off. Well, 
yeah, that's true. But if if you own Schrader's department store, wouldn't you use that loophole so you can actually make a living again? Absolutely. <laughs> and, so, and so that's that's the problem right now is is when government is trying to make these overarching mandates, it's really difficult for them to not, you know, get bizarre situations rather than kind of putting out general ideas and letting people kind of work these things out. Um, because then you kind of come up with these bizarre circumstances where, you know, Schrader's department store can be open to sell clothes, but the Two Rivers Clothing Company down on the south end of town there can't be open to sell their clothes necessarily. I know they're trying to sell masks like curbside or something. So I'm not sure exactly their situation, but generally speaking, clothing stores can't be open right now, which, you know, uh, one of my, uh, one of my, one of my family said, if you want to call clothing non-essential, go walk around naked and see how long they call that non-essential. But you know, it's I'm pretty sure clothing is an essential thing. So that's, that's the problem right now. So yeah, he is opening some things, but it's just, because it's government trying to make these decisions, it's kind of haphazard and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. And they're, they're going down a road they've never walked before. And, but I mean, good for Schrader's. I was really happy to see that. Plus uh, Red Bank is yeah. in there too. So, um, yeah. but one example that the governor gave was the possibility of opening the small retailers mm -hmm. sooner. And mm -hmm. part of what I had read was, you know, a lot of these smaller retailers are on a main street. It, mm -hmm. They're not like a Walmart where you get, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in. You, yeah. you get people in, you know, maybe one, two, three at a time. Um, yeah. So you can you can still observe that social distancing and, you know, yeah. take precautions. So and I know that um, that that would be fantastic. And I, I'm glad that he even mentioned the small retailers. You know, I was kind of surprised to see that. Um, now, Badger Bounce Back, what exactly is that? That That is the governor's, I hate to call it a plan because it's, it's really not a plan. It's kind of a basic idea of what he kind of envisions the opening of the state's economy is going to entail. That's kind of, so that, that's put out by his administration and he's saying that these are kind of what I envision happening before, as we open up the state. So we have several phases in it. Um, there's phase one, two, and three, and each there's different aspects of of all of that. But that's okay. that's, that's the like I said, I hate to call it a plan because it's not really a complete plan. It's guidelines, I guess, for okay. what he envisions. Do you think that that would be similar to Weedex reopening guidelines? I would assume that they would go hand in hand. We Weedex is. So, you're, you're talking about WEDIC as in the department WEDIC, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Right. Yeah. So WEDIC, what WEDIC is, WEDIC is kind of a more or less a branch of the administration. So more or less they're kind of in, in step there. I haven't looked to see if they put anything different on there, but my, my it's going to be, it's going to be largely the same. Okay. Yeah. That was the one that I had tried opening right before we started talking and it wouldn't open for me. Cause I was very curious. Um, because we had spoken with the secretary, um, Missy Hughes, uh -huh. several, it was probably about maybe three, four months ago uh -huh. uh, when we um, interviewed Governor Evers. And yeah. I was just curious to see what's, what the, you know, the plan is um, or the guidelines, because, you know, May 11th is going to be here real fast. May 26th yeah. is going to be here very quickly. Then what? Right. You know, then what? Right. Well, and that's so. There's a there's there's a couple other plans out there, and I, and I know some people are going to hate me for saying this, but you know, WMC, you know, big evil, big corporate, you know, they they support corporations, blah 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 blah. But they actually have a pretty reasonable plan, I believe, as far as economically. So there's other aspects of this too that we need to address, and so their their plan is a little bit narrowly focused. Um, but really, what what they they kind of laid out more of a specific plan on how to allow businesses to open up. And I think I'm hoping that the governor is open to institute something more along those lines um, because basically what they do is, um, basically what they do is, is basically say, well, you know, depending on what the county situation is and the type of business you have and all those types of things, this will automatically happen. And that's what's kind of missing from his plan is it's not like an automatic thing based off of what's, you know, 
the, what the situation is. Okay, and WMC, that's like the uh, the chamber for the state? That's a Wisconsin manufacturing? <laughs> it's actually like a, it, it's, it's an advocacy group for businesses. It's called Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce. They largely I advocate see. on behalf of larger companies, which is why some people think badly of them. Um, but it's not it's not a plan that they built in by themselves. They actually built it in in uh, cooperation with um, the Wisconsin independent businesses and the uh, the Wisconsin the the local chapter of the NFIB you know, the, for the smaller businesses, as well as a lot of local health departments. They talked with a lot of them to get their thoughts are on this. So they didn't build it by themselves. They're just kind of the ones that you know, being larger businesses, probably have more resources than some others, and so they kind of built the plan together but they they took all and they've got buy-in from a whole lot of organizations around the state so um as far as when we can hear something about the court case we are hoping to hear something as early as possibly late today knowing how courts tend to operate and and their timelines and everything um it's not uncommon to court for courts to like to drop things you know, at the last minute right before a weekend because then, you know, they kind of do it and then, you know, they don't have to hear about it. Uh, so plus take into account the fact that we have the May 11 deadline as far as governor being able to keep shut down without legislative approval. So we're, we've admitted all along that he can keep do the shutdown through May 11th without legislative oversight. We could overrule it theoretically, but he doesn't need permission. He just needs us to not take action against it. So given that, you know, May 11th is coming up next week. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to rule early, which is part of why I think they didn't rush things and why they kind of waited. Unlike when they ruled that the election would take place, you know, it's kind of like you have to make the decision now or it doesn't matter. Um, so we could hear something late today yet. Um, if we don't, then we are hoping early next week because otherwise you're getting past the May 11th deadline. And then it's like, well, are these legal orders or not? Because even if theoretically they ruled these orders illegal, without any kind of stay on them taking that order taking effect. Um, you know, the governor could always come back out and reissue the orders under what I believe is the legal way to do it under the emergency declaration. And that would allow him to go through the 11th anyways. Okay. So we, we expect to hear something before the 11th because otherwise you're going into the time where we think it's not legal for him to continue. Okay. So, well, hopefully you hear something today because the 11th, this is Friday, the 7th, 8th. 8th. Yeah, Friday the eighth, eleventh is going to be on Monday. So you know, I mean, we're coming right down to the wire. Right. Um, well, we'll stay tuned for that. And so, and so, what we asked now, we'll see what the court justices do. And so, I encourage you once again to, if anyone hasn't done it, go back and watch the Wisconsin Eye video because it's fascinating. Um, we asked the court to give a six day, I think it was a six day stay on their decision, which basically says that we, even if they rule in our favor. Um, we allow the order to continue to take place for six days after the ruling in order to give the legislature and the governor time to work out some something together. Um, I, so preferably, I'd like to have that happen sooner than later, because I don't think you should go past the 11th much <laughs> without okay. our permission. Um, but nevertheless, um, that is that is what we asked. And But at the same time, there were some justices I would say three of them for sure seem to be indicating that, you know, if we think this is illegal, why should we allow it to continue at all? So, I mean, theoretically, we could have them come back today and say, well, no, you're, this is illegal. It, and it's enough. It's not in effect anymore. And you could literally open the state of Wisconsin today. <laughs> um, now, once again, though, I think the governor would come back and just say, well, I have through the 11th, certainly which is another good reason to have it before the 11th, because then he could just come back and reissue the order, you know, an hour later under, under the proper means, which is under the emergency declaration. So another good reason for it to happen before the 11th, because if they do rule that it's just totally illegal and we don't want to stay on it, then it should happen before, before the governor's powers all go away. Right. Now, another thing that I wanted to bring up was um, I, I was reading the uh, League of Wisconsin Municipalities, May 2020, okay. And one of the articles, it was in the Wisconsin Policy Forum, the COVID-19 fiscal fallout for uh, Wisconsin uh, cities yeah. and villages. And I, you know, and as it's been explained to me, because I'm still new at a lot of, you know, uh, of this, um, yeah. 
that, you know, government tends to lag behind. So right now with, you know, with COVID-19 and people not working and not being able to pay, let's say, utilities right, or right. to pay their property taxes or maybe uh, even personal property taxes, and it can go on and on and on. Um, right. Cities and mun municipalities are going to suffer because oh, yes. municipalities are basically, those are businesses. Yeah. And <clears throat> my feeling is they should be run like businesses. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, is that, um, and the people that I have spoken to, I'm urging prudence and caution when it comes to the money, you know, your, your budget, um, these are not the halcyon years that they were looking to be. Right. And we have to really kind of, you know, it's not like, well, we have 10,000 here that we can just spend, you know, mm -hmm. and 10,000 over here. It adds up. So I just wanted to get your opinion on just fiscal responsibility from communities. If you're not, if you're not cutting or freezing, do it now. I, I'm going to say that you should be doing it now. I, I realized we were hoping for a lot better things. Um, but, you know, for all I disagree about with the governor, you know, he just recently cut the, the budget for all his departments by 5%, going back retroactively to the beginning of this fiscal year. Now, he exempted a bunch of stuff. So, you know, it's not quite 5%. So because he exempted a whole lot of things like what it doesn't matter. He exempted a bunch. Um, but he did he did more or less cut 5% out of the budget for that. Now, that's not going to be enough. I mean, we are talking, the governor is, the governor in one of his own press conferences recently said about, they expect about a $2 billion hole in the state budget, uh, presuming nothing happens from the feds. Which How much? Said two billion. With a B? With a B. Yeah, two billion. Uh, the total amount of money that the state more or less spends, I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but of, of the money that the state spends, it, uh, roughly $40 billion per year. Uh, I'm sorry, per, I think that's per budget. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. So per, per budget, so which is a two year, was a two year budget, the $40 billion per, per budget that we spend another 40 billion comes from federal matching and things on a whole bunch of different stuff. So roughly an $80 billion budget, roughly half of it is paid for directly by the state taxpayers. Um, and he's not, but that 5% that he did with all the exemptions only amounts up to about $70 million with an M. So a step in the right direction, but a very small step in the right direction, because uh, economically speaking, I mean, we are talking about a very significant financial hit. We are, I think we're still going to ask Governor Evers uh, to freeze the second year of spending in the budget so that the, the budget in the second year is the same as the first year of the biennium. Uh, I think we're still going to do that once we have better numbers. Uh, we're supposed to get some better approximations um, of what we can expect for revenues later, but um, <laughs> it's it's going to it's going to be painful because we are going to have to cut things that people don't want to ordinarily cut. I mean, uh, John Nigren, the, the representative who's on the Joint Finance Committee, the the chairman, one of the chairmen, is a it's a joint committee, so a joint chairman. Um, he said, look, if, if we don't get the economy moving soon and quickly, quickly and in full force, very quickly, um, we are looking at serious cuts in things like education and other things that people don't want to cut, but we are simply not going to have the money. I mean, and, and what, and what do we want to do increase? I mean, I, I, I did see this one person was po posting on Facebook the other day. Oh, this is a perfect time to raise the gas tax because, you know, gas prices are so low. People can't afford to pay their bills. And you want to raise taxes on them. I mean, that's, you know, Doyle, Doyle in the last couple of years of his, uh, of his uh, uh, administration, you know, Democrat preceding Scott Walker, and they made huge cuts to education because they just couldn't afford, they, they couldn't afford to continue to pay it. When you have significant economic downturn, and that's what situation we're in at this point, we're talking, if we go much longer, we are going to be in Great Depression level unemployment levels. I mean, they are talking 30%. Right. That is Great Depression levels. I mean, you can't, you can't have large amounts of expenditures if you don't have large amounts of money coming in. And, and, the, and the, the largest amount of money we had coming in 
honestly was from some of these businesses that have been doing very well. We actually got a ton of money from the corporate tax rate. That's that's dissipating very quickly. It it is, yeah. Um, I know an uh, excuse me, unemployment claims um, have topped half a million. Yeah, you know, total benefits paid have topped three hundred eighty four mil. About sixteen percent of available workers have sought unemployment benefits, and mm -hmm. where and I was seeing today that the rate could get up to about twenty eight percent. 30, I could absolutely see. And you're right. That is great depression era, you know, right. data. And it just, it's just remarkable how, how we went from one end of the spectrum to the other in such a short period of time. And I, it's, we just have to adjust and we have to fight back, you know, we and. And, and we and we need to and we need to open this kind. I know there's a lot of people out there telling us, "Oh, we 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 can't open this. We got we got to save people's lives and things." I, I get it, I get it. But this is so much bigger than just survival. <laughs> I mean, because if if you if you survive and then you have nothing to eat, then you're going to starve. And quite simply, that is what we are facing. You don't you don't think I'm a doomsday person. This was a New York Times article coming from the United Nations. The United Nations has declared if the if the world's economies do not open and open up very quickly, they are looking at 130 million people, million people dying worldwide from starvation because we just don't have the food. We we have crop we have uh, farmers plowing under crops. We have them euthanizing. Uh, pigs and cows. Uh, we have them pouring milk out on the fields. I mean, in the short term, maybe not a big deal because we had record amounts of pork stuck away in frozen storage, but it's going to come and come back to hit us hard if we don't open in the economy very soon. You want to talk about saving lives? This is bigger than just a disease. There is so much more to this, and, and there, let alone other impacts that people have on their lives. I mean, just the, the heartbreaking stories I've heard from not only business owners who are losing everything, but just individuals who can't, you know, hold a funeral for their, for their dad that died or, you know, somebody who's, they want to visit their, their uh, mother who's in a, who in, a, in a hospice and they, they, you know, they had to say goodbye to their mother over a phone because they couldn't go visit her in the hospice. And it's like, we, we need, we need to look at this larger picture and larger picture, even from the very single item that they claim this is all about saving lives if we don't open and open soon we are talking 130 million people dead that is real number coming from the united nations that's frightening and just right. uh, it's it's hard to grasp it's hard to wrap wrap your head around a number like that because it just seems unimaginable but um no you're right i mean in and the ramifications of what's happening now we probably won't see them maybe until 2021, you know, when it finally kind of, it's the, like a drawdown type of thing and it's mm -hmm. a domino effect. And we're, this isn't something that magically the doors are going to open and we're going to be back to the way we were. Mm -hmm. We're going to be seeing the results of all these different issues right. for months at a time, maybe years. The so, restaurant association has already said that even if we open today, probably close to 50% of the restaurants that have closed aren't coming back. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I, I, I sure, I sure hope some of the ones that I like to go to like Mahouts and stuff come back. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I honestly haven't talked to Wayne over there to figure out exactly his financial situation, but yeah. man, I tell you, it, it can't be pretty right now. No, it's not. So, I'll tell you what, do me a big favor. And uh, once the justices have made a decision, would you just send me a quick text? Sure, I'll do that. So I, Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow this the best that I can, but I can only yeah. find out so much, you know. And right. um, But I'd be very interested to know that, and then I can do a quick update for Two Rivers Talks. Sure. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today, and uh, I hope everything is going well with you and your family. It, it's going it's going well for us but i'm i'm in the bizarre situation of uh you know having a, a job because i get paid by the government and at the same time you know <laughs> trying to show everybody else who's still getting a paycheck that you know <laughs> other people are not and that's that's been so frustrating for me it's like don't we have empathy for what other people are going through i i 
it, it so many of things these things stories are breaking my heart and so many people every, anytime you talk about needing to open up it's all oh you want old people to die no i want people to have lives again that's what i want i just want people to have lives again that's what it comes down to and and i think we can do things fairly I say fairly safely because nothing's ever safe. You can drive in your car today and get and squirrel can run in front of you and you dodge and run into a telephone pole. Nothing is ever 100% safe, but we can do things as safely as we can and still get back to society, get back to the civilization that we all expect and all deserve to have back again, because this is not, we're not, we're not living lives anymore. We're, we're, we're surviving. And that's, you, you can do that very short term, but sooner or later, you got you got to get back to real life. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll be talking again really soon, I hope, because our right. conversations have been very um, illuminating um, because a lot of a lot of us lay people, we don't uh, we don't know exactly what's happening down in Madison or we hear the bits and pieces. So for you to be able to to. Uh, bring everything together for us so it makes it easier to understand is very appreciated so enjoy your family keep doing what you're doing you're doing a, a fantastic job yeah. and um we'll see what we'll see what the 11th brings <laughs> so, all right well okay. hang in there. all right thank you so much bye-bye bye now Good afternoon, everyone. This is Roger Russoff. I'm here joining the folks of Two Rivers Talks for your Main Street Minute. Um, as we have for a while, we're doing this uh, remotely in order to keep everyone safe and healthy. Um, I've got a few updates about upcoming events, the most important one being um, uh, that we recently made the decision to um, change the dates on this year's Cool City Classic Car Show and Cruise. Uh, the original dates, of course, the show is in its 20th year and has always been the end of June. Uh, it was scheduled for June 26th and 27th this year, but we made the decision to move that back to August 14th and 15th. Um, our plans right now are to run both the cruise on Friday night the 14th and the show on Saturday the 15th, the same we always do, as we always do. However, um, because we're living in a time when things are changing on a rapid basis, uh, some of those things may change. Um, if you have questions about any of those, you can call us at the Main Street office or uh, follow our website and our Facebook page, either the Cool City Classic Facebook page or the Two Rivers Main Street Facebook page, and we'll bring you updates as, uh, as often as we can. It's also our intent this year on June 26th, which would have been the original date of the cruise, um, to do a, a, I guess I'll say a smaller or shorter cruise. Um, we're still working on the beginning date for that. Hope to have that completed in the next few days. Um, and that one will just drive through downtown Two Rivers with no planned activities in the city. And um, a, after the cruise ends, we're going to encourage people to stay downtown and shop or stop at a restaurant and have dinner or something. Um, and we're also going to make that uh, particular event um, a fundraiser for uh, our local food pantry to Rivers Ecumenical Pantry. Um, we'll ask people that participate in the cruise to bring a non-perishable food item or a cash donation for TREP um, that we'll collect at the beginning of the cruise. Um, and again, um, still working out details on that. A lot, we, a lot of these decisions were just made in the last day or so and we're trying to finalize things. So um, we'll get that to you as soon as possible. Um, and you'll be able to find that information at the same place, tworiversmainstreet.com, or the Two Rivers Main Street Facebook pages would be the best places to go for that one. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to hold the car show again this year, um, which obviously was in doubt for a while, but um, we're looking forward to the event. Uh, we think it's a great event for the community, and um, the people that participate have a lot of fun. And uh, we hope you keep up to date. And, and if you've joined us in the past, please do again this year. If you um, haven't joined us in the past, the event's a lot of fun. Food trucks, spectacular cars. We had over 360 in the show last year. Um, and a great atmosphere and a great day in downtown Two Rivers. So we hope you join us there. I want to keep this brief. So um, I'm three minutes into my Main Street Minute. So um, 
Darla, Bill, stay well, and uh, thanks for bringing me along again this week, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.